watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. I have here in front of me the most wonderful book perhaps ever written about the conflict between the Arab world and the state of Israel, and more specifically the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's called Myths, Illusions, Peace. It's co-written by Dennis Ross and a remarkable young man named David Makovsky who's sitting with me right now. David is a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's also an adjunct lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, and he's the author of Making Peace with the PLO, and he at the moment lives in Washington, D.C., and he is one of the most articulate and insightful observers of the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And David, thank you so much for spending a moment with us. Well, thank you. You have written a fabulous book, and by the way, it's an easy read, but a brilliant book, so first, congratulations. Well, thank you very much. It's published by Viking, and it is my hope that every one of our audience goes out and get, gets Myths, Illusions, and Peace, so thank you for writing it. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, on page six <laughs> of your book, you and Dennis discuss the difference between the Arab world in general and what you call the Islamists. And there's a line I'm going to quote, and then I want you to tell me what the significance is of that line for you. David, you say that to the Islamists, not all the Arabs, but the Islamists, the extreme wings of the Arab community and the Muslim community, the existence of Israel, and I'm going to use your word, is a negation of their being. Do you remember writing that? A negation of their being. If the state of Israel is a negation of someone, and your point is they can't accept it as a reality, what can the Jewish world do about moving the Middle East conflict towards a resolution to peace if, in fact, those who are the most extreme and the most and those who seem to be threatening any moderates would see any existence of Israel as a negation of their being. My last point for our viewers is you and Dennis make the point that this is not a boundary dispute to them. It's an existential dispute. So talk to me a moment about how you can be the least bit optimistic when you tell us that one of the myths and illusions that we have to break is what this is really about. And for some in the Arab world, it's about their being. Look, I would say the following, that our point is that, as you pointed out <laughs> in quoting us, we don't see uh, the Arabs as a monolith. We think, just like in any people, there are differences between them. And the more you know the Palestinians, the more you see among them. There are people who feel the Islamists want to take them back to the 12th century, and they are scared by that. And there's some who don't think that's a threat to go to the 12th century. They think it's a promise. They want to go to the 12th century. So our point is to define and say, okay, given what's on that side, who are partners for us? And our view, and we think Jewish history also points it out, if someone says they want to kill you, you got to listen, <laughs> and you got to believe them. So we see that those people are out there, but we don't see them as, as the unanimous uh, side. We see it being an open contest. And in our view, what is need to happen is to help work with the, the moderates to empower them, because we think only the Palestinians can discredit their own radicals. Mm -hmm. We can't make the decisions for them, uh, but we've seen now what's going on in the West Bank. We think there's a convergence of interests between Israel and the Palestinian Authority against Hamas. And we're seeing this in terms of the economy. We're seeing this in terms of security cooperation, that 
the sides don't put out press releases to discuss because it's sensitive, but that this cooperation is ongoing. Uh, in 2010, in 2002, I should say, there were 410 Israelis were killed out of the West Bank. This year it's one. Now, Israel deserves part of the credit. The security barrier deserves part of it, but it's also the cooperation because they don't want another Gaza. They see Gaza is coming to a theater near you. In 2007, Hamas uh, threw uh, the Palestinian Authority out, and it got them to think, my God, we got to work closer with Israel. They found the prime minister who is trying to inculcate a culture of accountability. And that is? Salam Fayyad. As opposed to Mahmoud Abbas. Well, uh, Abbas is the president. He appointed Fayyad uh, as the prime minister, and he's really in charge of all the governance issues. And he basically says, you know, we can't just complain about what is the world doing to help us? What are we doing to help ourselves? And that culture of accountability is critical. And uh, I think you're seeing progress. The IMF says they have 7% growth. The security cooperation with Israel, I think, is the best in 16 years. Um, I'm not here to say we're in a messianic age, but I think the, the achievements on the ground really get to your point, which is that, that you can't think of uh, all the Palestinians as one monolith. And if you look at the polling data out of Gaza, people would rather have the approach of Abbas and Fayyad than uh, the approach of Hamas. So it's almost, think of it like this, think of it as almost, uh, and you know, no analogy is perfect, but think of it as West Berlin and East Berlin, two geographic and, and ideologically distinct entities where people are seeing, you know, what is succeeding and what isn't. And if you look at the polling data, Hamas is, is way down, and Abbas is, is much far higher up, and that's because they believe that this is more of a culture of performance, of accountability, that gives hope and, and coexistence, and that's something that, that Hamas cannot deliver. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, yeah. that there are many people who lead Jewish institutions mm -hmm. on the American scene who simply have lost faith in a moderate Palestinian leadership. And there are those who, uh, when I sit with and we talk about an Abbas, mm -hmm. they tell me, you know, Netanyahu gives a speech at Bar Ilan, and the next thing you know, Abbas gets up and says he wants none of it. And that what Abbas says still to the Arab world is that there must be the right of return. And that in essence, there's a sense that people believe Abbas represents more of the hardline philosophy of really there shouldn't be a state of Israel than we want to live side by side. Would you say to those Jewish leaders they're wrong? Well, first of all, I have a hard enough time keeping up with Israelis and Palestinians, so I usually don't insert myself into American <laughs> Jewish politics. So I'll start with that point. So I'll, I'll, but I'll speak to the generic point, yeah. as if Abbas is the continuation of Arafat That's and, and is a kind of a, a, you know, a rejectionist in a suit, so That's to speak. I, I just think it's not, it's not accurate. I mean, this is a guy who got death threats for saying as early as 2002, you know, the Intifada is, is a disaster. Yeah, our f future is with a two-state solution, and he got death threats okay. for it. And I think that that's, that's a very important point, and uh, he keeps reiterating it. I'm not saying all of his positions are positions that will lead to a treaty tomorrow. I think, you know, you can make that case on all sides. And before negotiation, each side is going to put forward more maximalist positions. But I do believe that there's a fundamental divide between those who say we cannot accept the state of Israel, uh, even if it was the size of a telephone booth in a Tel Aviv beach, which is basically the Hamas approach, and the Abbas approach, which is we have to live side and side with Israel. Then why is it that Abbas continues to talk about the right of return? Look, I, I'm not here to defend all of, all of his positions, but Yasser Arafat has left a toxic legacy. He told these refugees to keep their keys yes. of where they lived. And it's, um, you know, he should have been telling them, we're building a new state of Palestine. You know, the return is to that state. It's not to Israel. Sari Nuseiba, leading Palestinian intellectual, saying Israel would be suicidal to accept uh, uh, an unlimited, unqualified right of return. And the fact is, no such right. I mean, the UN General Assembly 194 that is quoted mm -hmm is it doesn't even say it and the general assembly resolutions you could get to pass you could say that the earth is flat i mean what counts is the security council and i think that that toxic legacy of arafat 
is something that is not easy um, to, to change. I'll tell you though a story that I am told by several people who were there that uh, Abu Mazen, as he's known, or Mahmoud Abbas, went to Tzafat, the Safed where he was born, and with his son to visit. Where, and, and the son said to him, you know, let's go in and see the home. And he said, no, I just want you to know where it was, but we don't live there anymore. That's Israel. We're trying to build the state of Palestine. Let's go home to Palestine. Now that, to me, is, is a powerful story. Um, and that legacy of Arafat to undo was going to take time. I personally don't believe that this issue is going to be solved tomorrow morning. Uh, like the issue of Jerusalem, I don't think it's going to be solved tomorrow morning. And I don't think we should try to solve things that we know we're going to fail. Leaders on both sides have to condition the societal landscape towards accommodation. And if they can't uh, on, on these two very sensitive issues at this time, then I think we've got to be careful not to put forward a position that would lead those negotiations to fail. Well, I think some of the other issues are more, are, are more ripe for resolution. Speak to me about the issue of demilitarization. And we heard mm. Prime Minister Netanyahu again say that any Palestinian state has to be a demilitarized state. Mm. There are some Palestinians who would never accept that notion, that if they have a state of their own, the integrity of that state right. would not permit them to uh, create it demilitarized. They want their own army. They want their own police. They want their own guns. To what extent is there within the Palestinian world, do you believe, a strong enough leadership which could some, in some way shape a Palestinian public opinion that would accept a demilitarized s Palestinian state? Well, let's be clear. I mean, we're talking about uh, policing, self-defense, and things like that. That You know, the Palestinian Authority has that today. They have guns. They have... Uh, so what does Israel mean when it well, says I mean, demilitarized? They don't want them to have tanks and an right, air force right. and, and rockets that could threaten Israelis. Right. They don't care that they are policing their own people. Israel, to this day, cooperates with the Palestinian Authority. Look, it's also the position of the United States that uh, we're talking about it, we, the U.S. position. We call it a non-militarized state, the same idea. And that's been the possess, position of success of U.S. administrations. I think the Palestinians understand that that's, you know, Israel is not, you know, going to give up land to, you know, to create an armed presence, you know, perched on its border against it. So I think most Palestinians understand that. You know, it could be that the more Israel talks about it, <laughs> the more they, it sounds like they're bowing to an Israeli diktat. So I think there's an, there's an issue of how it's presented, but I think on the substance, I don't think there's much debate. What you're also saying is that you believe there is a Palestinian leadership whom, if they could get a state next to Israel, they would accept the concept of demilitarization. I do think so. I, I think, you know, again, the polling data shows that most of them believe that that's what they're, that they're putting out. If you look at Khalil Shakaki's polls and it said, how many of you recognize, say we should recognize uh, Israel as a Jewish state, the numbers are 49% where I think maybe viewers of yours in different parts of America, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. Now the numbers were I think even 60% in the 90s at a time where there was longer periods of tranquility, uh, even though there wasn't the governance progress we see today. So I think the idea that nobody on the Palestinian side could stomach a, a Jewish state and all that, I don't think is accurate. And I think that the more that the Israel and the Palestinians work together on issues that they can work uh, on and, uh, and against the rejectionists, I think the more uh, there's a convergence of common interests and the more that people see that their lives are getting better. You know, if people can't get from Nablus to Ramallah, they don't tend to believe there could be a two-state solution. <laughs> so. The economic prosperity is, really, is linked to access and movement, but access and movement is linked to security cooperation. Thankfully, things have been quiet for the last few years. Sometimes we're at a position where people say, well, if it's, if it's violent, we can't make compromise. And if you're quiet, there's no need for compromise. Then you'll never have a, 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 a solution. I think our, we want to help empower these people. We understand that if these people are discredited on the Palestinian side, the alternative is not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn. It's Hamas, and therefore you have to work together again. But the security of Israel is not a footnote. Is that's integral. Without security for Israel, there's no two-state okay. solution. Dory Gold sits with us and says, under no circumstances will Israel permit there to be an East Jerusalem capital for a Palestinian state. What's your sense? 
I, I said before that I felt that Jerusalem refugees were issues yeah. where the leaders have not conditioned the societal landscape <laughs> in terms of the direction of accommodation, and I believe that today. So I, I, I don't think we should push on things where we're not going to succeed. But there, the issues over the land differences between Abbas and Omer were 4%. And there are land exchanges that each side could get what they want. 80% of the settlers live in less than 5% of the land. Most viewers don't know that. And, then, and those 5% is largely adjacent to the pre-1967 boundaries. I think in any deal, Israel should be able to annex those 80%. That's 220,000 people. And on the other hand, the Palestinians should get land swaps, land exchanges, uh, to offset that, and they could say, we got what Egypt got. We got the West Bank, and Israel got 80 percent of the settlers, and America got taking the settlements issue off the agenda, because now there's a border. And if you're in a border, you're not called a settler. You're called and what Israel. about Kiryat Arba? That's a hard one. But uh, that will be <laughs> left for the negotiations. Yes, but David, you're, you've said that now three times. You've said it about Jerusalem. You, no, you're saying no, it now no, about, no, no. Uh, yeah. in other words, no, look, well, I think uh, if you look at the blocks, yeah. I mean, look, I've done a lot of these maps on my own. I don't represent a government, so there's no Makovsky plan. It, if it fails, they'll call it the Makovsky plan after they've buried it. If it succeeds, they'll call it something else. They'll call it the Obama plan or Mitchell plan or something. Right, but, well, I, but my point is most of the, of the, of the blocks, uh, Malaya Dumim, Kush yes, even Ariel, Kedumim, uh, and some would argue, surprisingly, Ofran, Beit El. These are all within that 5%. And if they're offsetting swaps, yes. then each side could claim they got their core objective. Okay. I, I sort of want to sum up with you by asking you to understand my problem. Yeah. My problem is I speak to Jewish leader after Jewish mm -hmm. leader and they don't say anything like what you're saying. There is such a pessimism. By the way, there's a left, and the left says, this is what the left says to me, they're disillusioned. They still believe we should work for peace. They believe that's the only answer. Right. You have to work for peace. Right. They're against the settlements. They believe there should be a settlement freeze. But even the left that sits with me now says they're discouraged. When I hear you speak, and I, you're not whitewashing anything. You're not being. No, no. You're, you're not saying it's all rosy. No, no, no. But there is so much good, so yeah. much optimism, so much potential for resolution yeah. that I want you to speak to. What, what do you hear when you talk to other people? And what would you answer? You know, the the typical Jewish groups today who all worry that in fact you're dealing with an irredentist group that only want the destruction of Israel. And as Bernard Lewis says, we are not dealing a lot of a border dispute. If it was a border dispute, it'd be done already. Yeah. What it really is, is an, ex an existential argument that it is the negation of the Muslim Palestinian psyche, which is the real problem that cannot be overcome. Look, I, my, my view is, you know, you go, go to the West Bank, talk to the Palestinians. In my view, they're not monolithic, just like the Israelis are not monolithic. You have people on the right, you have people on the left. I'm not saying everything is a mirror image. All I'm saying is there are differences in every society among views. To think everything we know about American society, everything we know about Israeli society, everything we know about in European countries, have you found any society which is completely 100% in one direction? No. And what we've seen in all the polling, and I look at a ton of polls on the Palestinian side, we see differences. Most of them are for the two-state solution. Now, at a time that Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel is asking Abbas to say it's urgent that we reach a treaty, you know, I think, you know, maybe some of these Jewish groups don't want to get out ahead of, of the Israeli Prime Minister. I understand. But I think it would be a terrible error to say, uh, you know, instead of 50% of the people against us, we'll, we'll do nothing and we'll make 100% of the people against us, and somehow that will make Israel more secure. And look, when the lion lies, lies down with the lamb, given that it's a dangerous part of the world, Israel always is going to have to be the lion. So I think the idea that Israel will somehow be at everyone's mercy, I think, won't happen. That's why the Israeli security is not a footnote. It's at the core. Israel will not permit it to be otherwise. So in my view that the approach is right, which is identify 
who are your partners and who are, or were the, who are those who certainly do not wish you well, well. But just know if the people that your partner's with, if they are discredited, the people who pick up the pieces are, are not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn. They're Hamas. And that means the, da the danger, in my view, of doing nothing is, 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 is the greatest. Now, it doesn't mean Israel should take reckless risks. Mm -hmm. It should not. Mm -hmm. It should not. But it should find ways that you can help empower those Palestinians while Israel protects its own security. I think that's a balance that Israeli leaders, the people I've met in the Israeli defense establishment, working with Palestinian counterparts, that's the zone we're talking about. You know Barry Rubin? Sure. Barry Rubin comes on and says that in his wildest dreams, it would be 40 to 50 years before there's peace, and that people say to him in Israel, 40, 50 years, you're looking at 100 years before there's peace. Is he wrong? Look, the, the issue is how you define it. If you define it, define it as, as reconciliation between peoples, it will take time. There's a lot of trauma here on both sides. Uh, uh, the Palestinians are traumatized with the way since the events since 1967. Israel is traumatized by, uh, by uh, terrorism. So if we define reconciliation, I'm sure when the French and the Germans, right after World War II, if anyone said the French and the Germans are going to become trading partners, you'd say, yeah, never, <laughs> never. You know how many wars these people fought against each other? Never. But you know what? When the leaders made peace, uh, the peoples found a way to reconcile. So I think it starts with working with people who basically have a the similar interest with you, a convergence of interests. I think people do things for their own self-interest. It's the most likely reason to believe it's sustainable. And I think there's hope. Is there a guarantee? No. But I think there is a guarantee that if we, if we just say all the Palestinians are 100% against us, we will create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. You are a little hopeful. Yeah, a little. I'm a little hopeful. Okay. Uh, you know, we got to be, you know, we keep our eyes open. But there are good developments on the ground. Can I push the book one more time? I'm delighted and okay. will never say no. I, I, I really recommend this book, Myths, Illusions, Peace, by Dennis Ross and David Makovsky. And the myths and illusions that David and Dennis try to articulate are very often mistakes which many Americans and many American Jews bring to their view of the conflict. And I think that what one of the things the two of you are trying to say is that, a, you, that neither the left nor the right can impose a solution on these two peoples. Right. They can only facilitate. Is that That's about? Right. Yes. That's right. And when people say, why am I hopeful? I will say the following. I'm hopeful because I believe in the resilience of the people of Israel, that it's ultimately Israel's will to live is greater than its enemy's will to die. But the other side has to want it too. They have to want it too. And that's why, the, like I said, the polling data right now has been very good, uh, that they see Hamas has brought nothing in Gaza. but destruction and uh, I think most people would rather live in the West Bank where there's hope than live in a place where their leadership is offering nothing but claiming that in the afterlife they have some paradise. People would like to see in this world yeah. to see a, a better life as well. You wrote this with Dennis Ross and there are many American Jews who say that no matter what the Obama administration does, says whatever, that in essence if a Dennis Ross is around we're safe. Dennis has been moved to the Iranian desk. Does this mean he has less influence on American policy as it directly affects American-Israeli relations? Since June, Dennis has been moved from the State Department, where he worked exclusively on Iran, to the White House. And there, as the head of the central region, he deals both with Israel and Iran. So, you know, there's been a change. The president has asked him personally to come over and to uh, work on, on both sets of issues. Kol Tuv with Thank the book and with your wonderful work. And maybe one day when you're up in the New York area, we'll sit together. Always, I'd always be delighted. Thank you. David Muskovsky and his wonderful book, Myths, Illusions, and Peace. Thank you, David. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471.
Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.